What's up everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. On this Ending Explained, we're looking at the eco-horror The Beach House, where college sweethearts on a romantic getaway struggle for survival when unexpected guests exhibit signs of a mysterious infection. As far as the mysterious infection mentioned, that's where the whole eco-horror aspect comes into play, as what is released is from deep below the earth and most likely unleashed by incremental temperature increases over time, spawning an extinction event for our species. Sound familiar? I did enjoy this one, and in some ways it reminded me of The Thing, but a more apt companion would be the also quite recent Sea Fever, although I did prefer this one overall. Admittedly, The Beach House is a bit slow, as it is certainly an indie production, and takes its time building up to the horror, but I actually didn't mind the kind of meandering character development that it starts with. It was actually kind of relaxing, like a trip to the beach, which of course inevitably turns into a dangerous and deadly situation. This is also one that I can understand why it might leave the audience confused in the end, but this is also one that has all the pieces there in the story to help us fully understand the scenario and what is behind it. So let's take a nice trip to the beach house, breaking down the story, just what is the mysterious deadly microbe as well as its effects, and explaining the quite downer ending. Descending into the ocean, as we go further down, there's a strange cloud of particles amongst the water, a large dark cloud looming towards the surface, seeing it's actually spilling out of a rock. And this is our foreign contaminant that will essentially launch an extinction scenario. But our naive beachgoers have no idea what's bubbling under the surface. Young lovers Emily and Randall come to a remote beach house. Randall is sure that they'll be alone, as no one has been here in months. And as it's the off season, they pretty much have the entire neighborhood to themselves. It appears that they have recently gotten back together and are using this trip to reconcile some issues. Randall mentions how he's been thinking of this for so long, Emily sighing that she missed him. The two head upstairs and do the nasty. The deed done, we start to learn that Randall isn't exactly the most motivated guy out there, suggesting that they live here year round. She asks what about her grad school, which he scoffs at, calling it bullshit, offering it would be like being on vacation all the time. This must be at least part of their divide. She's very driven and intelligent, while he's just kind of a lazy, easygoing bum. Though they thought they had the place to themselves, she finds evidence that they aren't in the bathroom, seeing the medicine cabinet is loaded with prescription bottles. And in the kitchen, there's a freshly used pan and groceries in the fridge. And indeed, someone is found sitting down at the table. Emily sneaks out of sight, informing Randall of their surprise visitor. He calls it impossible, but she's positive that she saw someone. And oddly, when going back down to peak, the woman has vanished, but plainly see the stuff out everywhere. And moments later, the woman returns bearing a bucket of oysters fresh from the ocean, warmly greeting the two. Randall demands to know who she is and what she's doing here. She's confused as Doc said no one would be here. Randall understanding she must know his father, and she recognizes him, but it's been years, as they used to stay here many years ago with his family. It introduces herself as Jane. Her husband Mitch enters with groceries, who also reminisces about how long it's been since they've seen little Randy. Correcting him, it's Randall now. Big Randall to you, pal. Mitch used to work with his dad around 20 years ago, so it all sounds like they're not like intruders or anything like that. Emily apologizes, not wanting to ruin their weekend, but the couple insists that they stay for dinner. Emily goes outside to have a smoke, noticing a weird little slug guy on the deck, seeing it still kind of moving, squiggling around a bit, and maybe expanding in size. Our first subtle indication that the stuff in the ocean has already made its way onto the land, now in a drastically different form, and is joined by Randall, remembering them as old friends, and must have spoken to his dad about coming to the beach house. She's all, well, didn't you talk to him too? And he starts making excuses of things being strange lately, and expresses agitation at her as she's the one that wanted to come out here to straighten things out. So he didn't call his dad, it sounds like, and is just using some BS defense. Their rift comes to the surface too, learning that Randall just up and left school with no calls to her, and now sometime later we're back here like nothing's changed. Annoyed as they could have gone anywhere else, didn't have to be his dad's beach house. He apologizes, admitting that he messed up, promising to figure it out and telling her that he loves her. Over dinner, Mitch has his wife in stitches over a childhood story about Randall eating an oyster, which promptly caused him to toss his cookies. And they poke fun at him, what about tonight? No oysters? And he gives in, groaning fine for old time's sake, and slurps one down. Ooh, 
oh well, considering that weird substance was in the water, probably best to avoid anything coming out of it. But they don't know any better at this point. Too bad, Randy, you're done for. Also catching a glimpse of something starting to move in an oyster. Ah, uh -oh, it's been tainted by the particles just like the slugworm guy back on the deck. Mitch questions Emily about what she's studying, and she's obviously no dope, studying organic chemistry and wanting to study astrobiology as well. Bewildered, he's like, huh? Life on other planets? Or what are you talking about? She corrects that it's more like life on this planet, talking of how organisms can adapt to extreme environments in order to survive. But unfortunately for humans, we're a quite delicate species. The right temperature and environment developed and changed over billions of years to make it habitable for us, but one tiny thing could set off this balance and we'd be nothing. This obviously being the case with that dastardly sea dust. A subtle change caused its release and now we're all screwed because this substance, as we can see, is quite robust at adapting to its environment while humans are not. They turn to Randall, who stammers that he had it with school and needed to get away. Mitch knowing that his dad wouldn't be too thrilled about that, but he argues things are different now. He then wondered what's the point of the whole thing, just to get a job, then get married, have kids, paying taxes and bills and everything, concluding that he just doesn't buy into all that. But he is still figuring it out. It sounds like he uh, doesn't have anything figured out, that's fine. Jane gets all misty-eyed, thinking it must be nice to have that time to figure it out, crying it's good to hear his spirit and that she feels fortunate to be with them. All of this forlorn stuff, along with the mini meds, leads me to believe that Jane is terminally ill and nearing death's door, hence her lamenting over having precious time. Their evening hits a wrinkle when they run out of booze, but Randall has a spicy suggestion, asking if they're familiar with edibles. Emily tries to rein him in, but he's all in, despite her thinking it's insane and a bad idea, especially as she's medicated. Though after some discussion, the couple agrees, asking what are they, cut it in quarters or what? And they all take a chunk, waiting for it to kick in. Jade asks Emily about astrobiology, giving us more insight into our underwater intruder. At one point, there were only the very basic elements at various stages on the planet. The heat from the Earth's core kept churning for millions of years, like steam from water hitting a hot rock. Something foreign had to enter the environment in order for it to form in the first place, replicating over time and becoming the bottom floor of the ocean, all spurned on by that initial foreign matter that kicked it off initially. We're about to learn that there's a new foreign matter going on right now. The edibles start to take effect, Mitch staring and wonder at his hands while watching them. When going outside, they are greeted by an especially trippy sight. The entire sky now a deep purple hue, seeing it covering the trees, a windswept microbe of some kind, as Emily defines it. Jane wants to get a closer look. Yeah, go for it, I'm sure she'll be fine, leaving Mitch and Emily alone. Chiding her for smoking despite being a scientist, she admits to doing dumb shit too. And Mitch goes on to lament how kids see things differently now, thinking all of the information out there is scary. Yeah, I guess so. Their philosophical discussion is halted when he catches a foul whiff in the air, thinking it's maybe backed up sewage or something. Mitch saying that he was feeling lightheaded before and grows worried for his wife, wanting to go search for her. She's out in the forest, now glowing and covered in goo droplets in the trees. Already the substance has begun to consume and change our original environment, which it seems to do by attaching to a host of some kind, beginning with the dust particles that come together to take over and debilitate its target. She foolishly touches some of the stuff, causing her to immediately cough, which becomes more severe as the fog in the air grows thicker, which actually isn't fog, but more of that substance, which breathing in is most likely not a good thing. Just like with the stuff covering the trees, the same microbe is also airborne and designed to destroy any life forms that breathe it in over time. And it continues to spread, now reaching the porch of the house surrounding everything outside, making it hard to see further than even a few inches in front of her and decides to shut the door. While Randall is less than concerned, just kind of lying there on the ground all high and useless. The fog then makes its way inside, turning things glitchy and the colors turn primary. And she notes the same smell from earlier. She attempts to concentrate, complaining of seeing sunspots. And here's Mitch outside, his voice turning distorted and echoey. Things grow more intense and she sits down not feeling well, her vision becoming more distorted and she falls unconscious. Again, all of these are effects of breathing in the foreign microbe. It seems to specifically cause its host to become paralyzed and unable to fight back, allowing it to further infect its subject. She comes to in the middle of the night to total darkness, Randall in the exact same spot, groaning in response when she calls for him. She then hears Jane coughing elsewhere in the house and attempts to get a closer look in the bathroom, hearing horrible retching coming from the other side of the door. But 
Mitch closes it before she can get a good look. Whatever it is, is not good. Crawling into bed. When looking at the lamp, the light exposes a ton of the smaller particles still lingering in the air. The next day, already past noon, she wakes up asking Randall how he is, mumbling he's fine, while she still feels stoned and has a horrible taste in her mouth. In looking out the window, the fog is gone, but there's a leftover film substance on the window left behind. So it's not truly gone, as we see. Downstairs, she sees Jane sitting at the table facing away, but when she tries to talk to her, she says nothing, noticing a bunch of her meds sprawled out all over the table, Emily asking if she needs help with them. Coming around to her face, we see it's kind of burned up, and she asks where Mitch is, her finally responding inquisitively, Mitch? From what we can gather, by touching that stuff on the tree directly, as well as breathing in the death fog, she has gotten a much more concentrated dose of the particles, which is clearly having effects on her physically. Jane weakly gets to her feet, slowly making her way across the room. On the stairs, Randall passes her, trying to be pleasant while she's clearly struggling, dragging herself up the stairs by the railing. Ah, she's fine, so they go to the beach, where they're confused, wondering why Mitch left her, especially considering her state, but thinking maybe he went swimming, so they decide to catch some rays. Suddenly, Randall's stomach starts gurgling, sending him in a rush back to the house to use the bathroom. Told you those oysters will come back to get you, along with the fog. She asks if he's okay. He says he's fine and will be right back, noticing that he leaves their car keys behind, which becomes a problem later. Moments after he rushes off, Mitch appears, wondering where everyone is, remembering how beautiful it was up here, but feels this time something is off. While at the beach house, Randall does his business and goes to wash his hands. Initially, nothing comes out of the faucet, which then spurts out water filled with a cloudy substance, which he, of course, touches. I, I guess I would too. I don't know, maybe poke it with a stick or something first just to see what happens. Probably, probably smart. About to head back, he's stopped by more strange sounds coming from upstairs. He goes to the bathroom door, hearing awful things on the other side, waiting for a moment before deciding to come in and check on Jane. Fatal mistake, Randy boy. At the beach, Mitch goes on about how he loved coming here with Jane as it felt frozen in time. They hadn't been here in so long, and he wanted her to have one last special time here, making it pretty clear that she has some kind of terminal illness now, in fact, it was something even more severe. Mitch wistfully sang, when you see someone change in front of you and you know that there's no going back, it scares him to death, he admits. She tries to ask how Jane is doing, but he deflects the question, pointing out what a nice day it is. He struggles to get to his feet, unconvincingly saying everything's fine, and goes for a dip. He goes out uh, really far in the water, just keeps walking deeper and deeper into the ocean. Emily yells out to him, but he just keeps going, getting smaller on the horizon and until his head disappears under the water. And yeah, it's just gone, dude. I'd imagine that just like his wife who was infected, it spread to him too. Hence the struggle scene when getting to his feet, and rather than going through the changes that he saw Jane going through, he opts to simply end his life before this can happen. Emily looks down to her feet, seeing she stepped in something really weird, an entanglement of slime and stuff, looking kind of like an otherworldly jellyfish. She gets the substance off her foot, but even that moment of contact leaves a painful red mark and see that one tendril has already burrowed its way into her foot. Ooh. Looking down, the beach is now lined with a bunch of dumpling-looking creatures all along the shore, giving us further insight into how this stuff grows and evolves. It perhaps starts as the small particles and attaches itself to a host, like a sea creature, and promptly takes over its shell for its own use growing to the tendrils and then into these deadly dumplings of doom. Finding her leg unable to really function, she has to crawl up the dauntingly long staircase to get back to the house. There she yells for Randall, getting no response. So she's on her own, going to the kitchen, and checks her foot, which is already looking much worse. The little tendril guy briefly poking out to say, hello! She retrieves some vinegar from under the sink to clean it, and it looks like it really hurts, yowling in anguish as soon as pouring it on her foot. That stuff is not good for humans, it turns out. She reaches up to the counter for a knife and grabs some tongs for a little makeshift surgery. Using the tongs, she yanks out the little worm guy and it is pretty dang long. It's still squiggling around after she removes it. Ugh, gross. But at least the missus has some mighty fine paid meds for her because that shit has gotta hurt. She stumbles back to her room for some fresh clothes and attempts to put her shoe on, seeing out of focus someone crawling on the floor behind her. It's Randall groaning and gagging, seeing a chain Jane right behind, looking frenzied, white milky eyes, and foam pouring out of her mouth. The substance has completely consumed and changed her, no longer retaining any of her human characteristics, but simply fueled by further spreading
fighting the microbes infection at any cost. She tumbles down the stairs, Emily trying to help Randall to his feet and keep going, getting outside. She gets closer and closer, Emily using some hose around the door to keep it closed, but that won't slow her down, crashing right through the window. Asking if he has the car keys, we remember they're still down on the beach, forcing them to flee down the hill to the closest neighbor's house. Randall is growing worse, complaining his entire body is messed up and he needs to get to a hospital as soon as possible. She asks what happened with Jane, but he says that he can't remember. Most likely, she further infected him with the sea stuff. The neighbor is also turned, forcing them to get a move on, entering into another haze, and they keep walking long into the night, the fog still lingering in the air many hours later. Randall gets weaker and saying he can't breathe, collapsing to the ground. They are given momentary fresh hope, seeing a nearby light coming from an empty truck. She looks around for the keys to no avail, but at least there's a radio, trying to call anybody, but only getting static initially, until a voice crackles through. Through the weak signal, they hear the man say, extremely dangerous. Everyone is exposed, and to get indoors and seal the windows, warning them to not breathe it in. Oh well, they've already been doing that for hours at this point. She asks if it's the fog, the man clarifying it's not fog as the line goes dead. As we know, it is an airborne version of that ocean substance, which is, you know, pretty obvious at this point. Returning to Randall, he's gasping on the ground, mumbling maybe it wasn't such a good idea to come to the beach. Uh, yeah, probably not, dude. She helps him to his feet and to another house, looking for a way to get in. She's stopped in pain as well, things turning distorted once more. And while the fog appears to be less concentrated than, say, eating a tainted oyster or touching the tree goo, but just the same, continued exposure inevitably will lead to death. Randall surprises her. She's feeling worse now herself, and know they need to get inside immediately and stop breathing this crap in. They break a window, her pushing him in first and following after landing on her bum foot painfully. She grabs him, getting away from the fog, and closes the door to keep the stuff out. In the main room, they smell rotten eggs in the air, and there's stuff strewn all over the floor. And unfortunately, the landline is down. While Emily searches for car keys. Now understanding the fog isn't fog, she knows it must be from the water. An algae bloom affecting the air, she considers. Randall assuming that means they're fucked, right? Luckily, they at least have some bottled water that isn't contaminated. And the TV they find is overtaken with emergency broadcast on every station. So they try the radio, and after some fiddling, come across a broadcast from an oceanographic research institute that confirms what Emily has been suspecting. That this came from microbes preserved in rocks. The Earth's heat freed the bacterial form bubbling to the surface. And now Randall is even more confident that they're fucked. Yeah, that sounds, sounds right, Randall. Emily suggests sealing the windows and staying here until morning, but Randall thinks that he won't make it. In anguish over feeling the churning in his body, he's disappointed over how much time he's wasted in his life, admitting he's scared. She encourages him not to be and hang in there, saying that she can't do this alone. Looking down the hall, she sees the stuff starting to get in and sets about sealing up all the cracks, overhearing more from the radio about how it's not a carbon-based life form as we are, but something else, and entirely unknown. Downstairs, she finds some scuba tanks, and luckily they still have some oxygen too, which they can use to breathe in the dangerous fog. They continue on the radio, that until our planet becomes like all others, an extinction event will come for all forms of life on Earth, which Randall can certainly vouch for, starting to groan, and pukes up the slime, and in his puke, we see a little organism. Definitely not a good thing, I wager, I mean, I'm no doctor. Emily's still busy with the tank. She hears Randall retching upstairs. Lying on the floor, he opens his eyes, now milky white, as he sees his final vision as a human. The TV turns blurry, and he begins to croak and violently rolls over, while Emily is confronted with something up teen times more disturbing. A dude on the ground all eaten up, and another fleshy creature on top of him which shoots some goo at you. Once again, confirming the host attachment thing. The guy on top is most likely what becomes of humans after even more time exposed. Like Jane and the other will eventually become this primordial mound of flesh, searching out others to feed upon. She quickly grabs the other tank and flees upstairs, locking the door. A changed Randall crawls at her, Emily crying in anguish as he keeps crawling and reaching out for her. She hits him in the face with the tank, starting to sob. She hits him again, and he's done for. Well, at least they can get killed. Having murdered her boyfriend, she starts weeping, but refuses to give up, luckily spotting some car keys, after all, hiding under a credenza. Utilizing the tank to breathe, she navigates the fog to a truck that starts right up, making sure to turn off the AC first. Don't want that shit getting in here. She carefully drives, barely able to see anything through the flippin' fog. Just as she reaches a clearer point and can actually see, she's too late. A tree right in front of her and she crashes right into it, taking the truck out of commission. Well, that was short-lived. She comes to and the fog has penetrated the cab.
lap, immediately causing her to cough uncontrollably, as well as making it hard to breathe. She tries to use the oxygen, but it's now busted or empty, and she crawls out of the truck, ending up in a pool of water. And things again start getting distorted and trippy, her face melting away into static and churning foamy water. The next day, the fog has completely cleared, floating back down to the beach where Emily is lying motionless. She opens her eyes, now white, repeating don't be scared to herself as the tide crashes over her, and when retreating, she has disappeared in the water. Now she has become a part of the microbes just as the others, and inevitably, the entire planet will. Kind of a bummer, but oh well, it's kind of hopeless anyway, that's the whole point. As was repeatedly iterated, there's a natural progression at play here. Inevitably, the Earth's core temp will continue to rise and lead to a release of these microbes, as humankind, and indeed our entire ecosystem, is incredibly delicate. Delicate. All it took was this one little thing to completely end our species and our planet as we know it. Just as Emily was talking about from the very beginning. Yeah. That brings us to the conclusion of this ending explained for the Beach House. You can check it out now on Shudder, but I'm sure it'll be out in a few months on other BOD platforms to rent as well. Obviously, this is meant to act as a warning of our planet inevitably turning on us. The unfortunate thing, I feel like just like the characters in the movie, we'll probably figure out what's going on way too late. And by then, it'll just be like, bye-bye humanity, just like that. Gone in a blink of an eye. Dang, delicate humans. Man, I don't want to get turned turned into a milky-eyed monster thing, so that's why I'll be sealing my windows and staying indoors forever. It's the only way. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any TV shows or movies you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Thonflix. What did you guys think of The Beach House and its ending? What's your favorite eco-horror movie? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Thonflix. See you next time.